Uh, in the last lecture on authoritarianism, we described the authoritarian character. Remember someone that was aggressive, conventional, um, had a, superst a superstitious, uh, obsessed with power and toughness, uh, aggressive towards minority groups. So what we're going to consider now is how do you become authoritarian? Where does this personality syndrome, how does it develop? Where does it come from? The theory of authoritarianism is a psychodynamic theory. It's influenced by the ideas of Sigmund Freud and it suggests that authoritarianism develops in early childhood practices, in early childhood, sorry, upbringing. I've listed this in, in, in points here. So the first point says that personality development involves the repression of certain basic needs, wishes and desires. Now, in Freud's theory, if you've studied Freud, you'll understand that these needs and desires are, are the needs for sex and aggression. Uh, Freud argues that we, we're all animals, basically, and the id, or these basic animal or biological instinctive drives are, are, are very powerful. And the second point there is that parents play a very important role in helping us to repress and redirect. We can't act out these animal drives, the, the, the desire for sex, these aggressive impulses that animals have because of uh, social norms. So Freud says at the bottom here you've got these uh, id impulses, these basic animal impulses, and there you've got society's norms, society's rules, that he calls that the superego. And yeah, in between, Freud argues we have the ego or the personality. And so parents help us in, in, in child rearing to integrate these basic animal desires and the society's norms into healthy personality development. But now, in certain kind of parenting, if parents are particularly harsh, if they hit their children, disciplinarian, punitive, it's that's the kind of context where authoritarianism arises with these with these very harsh kinds of parenting practices, disciplinarian parents. Here's a slide that shows the kinds of parenting that we're talking about here. What is authoritarian parenting? Rigid morality. There's clear boundaries between right and wrong. There's no middle line, no gray area in between. The second feature, parents, these authoritarian view children as basically sinful or willful. Children must be learned, taught to be obedient. Uh, lots of uh, smacks and hidings will, will help that child get rid of all those bad traits. These parents view society as the struggle, the survival of the fittest. Children must be taught to do the best, to compete, to, to, uh, to survive in this, in this tough world. The fourth trait there is that fathers must imp inspire respect. Children should be seen and not heard. They must respect their parents. If they don't respect them, they get hit. They get uh, severely physical punishment. This is the, the characteristic. It's an old-fashioned style of punitive parenting. The, so what does this do in terms of personality development, this kind of parenting? Well, step number four, in this situation, you can understand the child becoming aggressive towards his parents. If you keep on getting hit and uh, treated violently by your parents, you, 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 you tend to become aggressive toward them. But can you express this aggression? Can you shout back, fight back? No, you can't, because if you do, what will happen? More smacks, more violence, more uh, severe parenting, punitive parenting. And so what happens to all this pent up aggression that's uh, building up in this child? It can't be expressed toward the parents and so it becomes repressed into the unconscious. And this is the Freudian uh, account of where the anger and the hatred comes from. It's originally directed toward the parents in, in, as a young child, but cannot be expressed, so the, the anger is repressed. And then what happens? It becomes displaced. Rather than being directed toward the parents, the anger is now directed towards outgroups, um, groups that your parents dislike. 
subordinate groups in society. So ultimately, point number six at the end, you've got this young person, this person is growing up, has got a lot of respect for all the authorities, they're subservient towards all the authorities, yes, we obey all the authorities, we obey our parents, and yet there's this, this, this built up in aggression that's become repressed into the unconscious and now is displaced onto minority and other groups. And so the account of prejudice, the account of racism from this personality-based theory suggests that, that racism, hostility, prejudice come from displaced aggression. So it's a psychodynamic account. So the, the key things here to remember are the aggression is repressed, it's pushed into the unconscious, and then it's displaced, it's targeted not at the original cause of the aggression, but at other groups, displacement. So is there proof for this theory? That's, we see the development of the theory. We've uh, now considered the, the individual development of the theory, how children become authoritarians, but is there proof? Well, what the original authors, Adorno et al. did, is they created the scale called the fascism scale. This scale had no reference to other groups. It was just a measure of the personality syndrome. And then they conducted research where they uh, administered this personality measure together with a measure of prejudice or racism. And they said, do, does this personality measure that's got nothing to do with racism correlate with measures of racism? And <coughs> here's an example of some of the items in this uh, personality measure. Here, for example, the first one of their conventionalism. A person who has bad manners, habits and breeding can hardly expect to get on with other people. So it's, the, the items target the personality syndrome. Look at anti-interception, item number four. Nowadays, more and more people are prying into matters that should remain personal and private. So the F scale, or the, the fascism scale, what is called, this measure of authoritarianism, consisted of personality, a measure of personality that had nothing to do with uh, race groups, etc. And it's literally thousands of studies now have been done over the past 50, 60 years have shown that authoritarianism is very highly correlated with racism towards and prejudice towards a variety of groups. And the correlation of the order of about 0.75. So that's a very, very strong correlation. So there's lots of evidence that authoritarianism underlies or is associated with racism. If you want to see if you authoritarian, you can go online to this link over here. There's an authoritarian test. You can complete it yourself and you can measure your own levels of authoritarianism. So what do you think of this as an explanation for racism and prejudice? Certainly, it's a useful explanation. It accounts for extreme cases like Barr and Stratum, where there does seem to be some kind of pathology. If you look at the history of Barr and Stratum or Eugene to Blanche or any of these, these fascists, these right-wingers, these really hateful people, you'll see that they had child-rearing like this. Their fathers used to beat them. They developed this respect for their fathers. So this, this, this process seems to um, work. It seems to be a good explanation for extreme cases of racism. But generally, there are a number of problems with the theory. Firstly, it, it can't account for the collective nature of racism. So before the Second World War, when there was all this fascism and the Holocaust, you had lots of authoritarians, lots of racists, but afterwards, quickly the racism disappeared. It's unlikely that the child rearing practices change. How could it change? Even in South Africa, you know, they say that uh, you, you, the, at the end of apartheid, racism uh, declined rapidly, but child rearing stayed much the same. Those people that, uh, that were alive in apartheid, many of them are still alive today. So it cannot account for collective shifts. Historically, racism goes up and down. Um, so this targets much more individuals, this theory, than the collective. Secondly, the, the, the theory focuses on individual irrationality. The basic cause of racism is something wrong in individuals' minds. There's a kind of psychological pathology there. Uh, whereas many of the cases of racism, they're institutional, it's organizational. They're not really mad people behind uh, many instances of racism. 
The third problem is that it ignores history. It's a static account of racism. And yet racism varies across contexts. In some contexts, an individual might not be racist, might express quite liberal opinions, quite tolerant opinions, even liking other groups. But yet in another kind of context, maybe at home, around the bra or something like that, then they would express other kinds of opinions. And so the personality-based accounts battle to explain for situational variation. They battle to explain for historical variations because they they focus on crazy individuals and finally the fourth problem is that it tends to associate racism with the right ring with fascists with extremists etc whereas racism is uh, practiced and uh, prejudice or beliefs that are held right across society on the right of the on the left in the center people that are without much politics racism seems to be characteristic of many people in our society our next set of lectures will look at uh, group-based explanations of racism. Thank you.